These next tests require cooperation. Consequently, they have never been solved by a human. That's where you come in. You don't know pride. You don't know fear. You don't know anything. You'll be perfect. Chamber completed. Continue testing. Continue testing. Continue testing. The two of you have forged an excellent partnership. Now it's time for your real purpose. Don't disappoint me. Or I'll make you wish you could die. Have you been? Is behind us for science, you monster. Cave Johnson here. Fact the key to any successful cooperative test is trust, and as our data clearly shows, humans cannot be trusted. The solution robots. Then fire the guys who made those robots and build better robots. Then run those robots through a regimen of trust exercises, creating a foundation of mutual respect, reinforced by the simulated bonds of artificial friendship. Inspiring stuff. And finally, we put that trust to the test. Bam! Robots gave us six extra seconds of cooperation. Good job, robots. Gabe Johnson, we're done here. Dave Johnson here. This is a test chamber. Four walls, ceiling, and a floor. Good enough for science. Not aperture science. Gentlemen, I give you panels. The planks of tomorrow. Fully configurable. Infinitely variable. Safe. Aperture brand panels will assist your test subjects every step of the way. That is not a panel. That's a crusher. We sell them too. Cave Johnson here, introducing the consumer version of our most popular military grade product. Hi, hello. The turret. How do we get so many bullets in them? Like this. Plus, we fire the whole bullet. That's 65% more bullet per bullet. 
This is the same technology we've been using on robots for decades. <laughs> Scares the hell out of them. They come in hundreds of designer colors, including forest, desert, Different. table, uh, evening at the improv. What idiot picked these? Then we box them up and ship them straight to your doorstep so you can protect the things that matter most. Good night. Just try and get close to that baby. <laughs> your funeral. Gabe Johnson, we're done here. Hello, investors. Cave Johnson here. Now, I know you've sunk a lot of money into the dual portal device, but I'm here to tell you we're not banging rocks together over here. We know how to make a quantum space hole. Carolyn? See? Portal here, portal there. <laughs> Look at this thing go. Now, we have run into a reproducible human error problem. A lot of expensive equipment getting broken. But don't worry. Cave took care of it. Gentlemen, I give you the long fall boot. Think of it as a foot-based suit of armor for the portal device. I'm not gonna lie to you, it's expensive as hell. But check this out. We told this test subject to just go ahead and try to land on her head. <laughs> she can't do it. Good work, Boots. So anyway, we're between banks right now. Just make those checks out to cash. Cave Johnson, we're done here. Вы заметили, что я не осталась до конца последнего испытания. Я была уверена, что вы пройдете. И знаете, где я была? Я была снаружи и смотрела, как резвятся олени. Вам ведь нет дела до того, что снаружи. In our first implementation, gestures were automatically selected based on the player's context. For example, Blue might do a special gesture when standing on a floor button. Players became bored of seeing these gestures so quickly that they stopped using them before discovering any of the special context. Because of this, we decided to give players control of gestures as a way to express themselves. But when shown the full set from the start, they were overwhelmed by all the choices. By awarding gestures as the game progresses, we allow players to familiarize themselves with each gesture in turn. Leaving visible empty slots in the gesture wheel lets players anticipate that they'll be rewarded with cool new gestures as they progress. The gesture wheel provides quick access so that players can feel comfortable tossing out a gesture during downtime, letting them pick the perfect moment to share a high five. We have a taunt where one robot steals the other's core. When implemented, it was the only taunt that required one person to initiate. Because of this, we were afraid that it would be used for griefing. We were in the process of rethinking our approach when early playtesters rated this as their favorite taunt. It was also the most used team taunt because it only required one player to initiate and was easier to use than the others. We ended up changing all the other team taunts to emulate the way stealing the core works. Airlocks were introduced mainly as a way to allow players to focus on individual puzzles. In some of our early investigations, areas contained puzzles that were meant to be solved as a group as well as others that were for individual solution. But we found that if players could move freely between them, they logically assumed that the individual puzzles were part of one big puzzle. This had bad results. For clarity, we created these airlock-like spawn rooms that act as checkpoints between puzzles. Once both players entered the airlock, we lock off access.
In Left 4 Dead 2, we authored simple fogged black versions of the world as monolithic models to avoid the CPU overhead of rendering the world again for water reflections. This worked well for the Left 4 Dead 2 outdoor environments where most light comes from the sky. But Portal 2 is almost entirely indoors, so the color and value of the world geometry is apparent in the water reflections. Since the Portal 2 world geometry is relatively simple, we automatically build a version of the world geometry that has a single texture that combines both lighting and surface shading, along with another texture that has just surface shading. The latter texture is used when rendering dynamic lights. These textures are at the same spatial resolution as the light maps and get packed into a single large atlas texture per level. Drawing this simple world imposter takes very little CPU time, which was a limited resource on Portal 2 due to the many portal views, split screen views, and water reflection views that we needed to render. We initially planned on using the world imposters only for water reflection rendering, but we ended up using it to improve the performance in split screen mode where it is used for rendering distant portals and portals that are two levels deep. We also used the world imposters to render water in full screen co-op mode to give us some performance overhead since the co-op mode has more portal views to render than single player mode. Normally in games when players die, they see this as a big failure. But in Portal, death is a normal part of the puzzle solving experience. In co-op, death not only happens more frequently, but it can happen at the hands of your partner, purely accidentally, of course. We felt it was important to not only make death no big deal, but to make it fun. Early on, we tried some elaborate death animations, such as showing your robot slowly getting crushed under a giant crusher. These were awesome to watch, but they quickly became repetitive. Also, after a very short while, players grew afraid to take risks. The fear of having to wait a long time before trying again prevented them from simply playing and experimenting in the spirit of fun. We had to find the right balance where death was quick enough to be a non-penalty and elaborate enough to be visceral and satisfying. A fun payoff for creative play. We noticed that after playtesters had solved a difficult puzzle together, they'd sometimes pause before funneling through the exit door to repeatedly jump up and down in excitement. We realized that these meeting places would be the perfect time to allow players to high-five each other and celebrate their victory in style. Our first interface attempt had one player initiate a high five by holding their hand up and waiting, the other player could join in by selecting the same gesture. If they were standing in the correct positions relative to each other, they'd pull off a high five. But learning the correct place to stand was too difficult, so we decided to automatically move the bots into the correct position for the high five. Sometimes however the player who wanted to high five would be left hanging as the other player ran ahead without accepting. Increasing the time that the initiator waited with his hand up gave the other player time to return and accept. But being frozen into place for more than a few seconds was too frustrating. So finally, we made players auto-accept the team gestures. Now when the mood strikes either player, the game always ensures a successful celebration. Early on we realized that trying to tell your partner where to go, where to look, or where to place a portal was going to be really hard. Even with voice chat, Saying, over there, doesn't give enough information to your partner within the 3D space. Players kept wanting to get up and point directly at their partner's screen. We developed the ping tool to address this problem. Because the ping tool was so important, we decided to train players in its use before we did anything else. We held back on the vast majority of player actions and let the players focus entirely on the ping tool. This is why the co-op bots start separated in a tube, without even the ability to walk or shoot a portal. Something that really surprised us was how often playtesters stated that they loved the basic experience of handing off a cube to their partner. Players didn't expect such a fundamental physical interaction to just work in a game. Before trying it for the first time, they would discuss their plan as if it were some unique or special new game mechanic. When it just worked, they were overjoyed. Several puzzles in the game require the players to take on distinct, intertwined roles. We call these asymmetric chambers trust puzzles, because one player is often placing their life in the hands of the other. When one player accidentally kills the other, it almost always ends in laughter. So much laughter that we sometimes had to question if it really was a legitimate accident. These puzzles also require players to stay in constant communication, which naturally leads to some great moments of cooperative bonding. While some teams found these stressful, for many partners, 
these puzzles were their favorite type, but everyone agreed that they added much needed variety and a nice change of pace. And by swapping roles, each player can get an entirely different experience within the exact same puzzle. Most players don't realize that the ping tool is context sensitive. When they're playing voice enabled, players usually rely on the look portion of the ping tool. Without voice, icons such as press the button or stand here become much more important. In laying out the structure of our hub, we had a number of challenges that were new and specific to co-op play. We have to assume that each player has made different progress throughout the game, playing with different partners. Starting in the neutral center of the hub was a way of making sure that they had a chance and place to coordinate. Players needed a way to agree on where to go, and a way to visualize each other's completion data. As they played, they needed concrete feedback on how much progress they had made. In seeking solutions, we felt it was important to keep the player in the game space, rather than resorting to menus and UI that would take them out of the game. Therefore, players can clearly see their status over the doors, and they navigate by walking to the course in the 3D space. GLaDOS is there to connect the experience to the single-player game, while also holding the player's hands a bit to keep the co-op goals and feedback clear. Our initial goal in designing the hub was to provide players with a lot of choices, so that they could sample a variety of game types. The idea was that if they got stuck or needed a break, they could pick another test chamber or another mechanic to explore. In reality, this prevented us from doing sufficient training and limited the overall scope of the puzzles. With such a flat structure, it was much harder to layer old mechanics onto new ones because we couldn't guarantee that players understood what they needed to know to solve a puzzle. By going linear, we could guarantee prior knowledge and provide a much better experience, more satisfying pacing, and a story that gathered momentum over a long period of time. The visual design of robots began with lots of concept art. The initial round of concepts explored all kinds of forms, from human to the more abstract. We found ourselves gravitating towards shapes that reminded us of the sphere and the turret in the original portal. Whilst keeping with the established portal design aesthetic, we were keen to create all new characters, and, being a duo, it was important that they were their own separate designs, rather than identical copies of each other. Unlike, for instance, Team Fortress 2, where a clean silhouette is essential for communicating the nature of a character, we had an opportunity here to play with designs that were a bit messy, with things sticking out of them so they looked half manufactured, half improvised. Once we had agreed on rough designs in 2D, we began to build the shapes in 3D, and this is where the next level of improvisation and experimentation occurred. Usually, a model will be designed and built in 3D and then rigged for animation, but here we allowed the rigging process to inform the models. We wanted to celebrate the mechanics of robots. We allowed The visual design of robots began with lots of concept art. The initial round of concepts explored all kinds of forms, from human to the more abstract. We found ourselves gravitating towards shapes that reminded us of the sphere and the turret in the original portal. Whilst keeping with the established portal design aesthetic, we were keen to create all new characters, and, being a duo, it was important that they were their own separate designs, rather than identical copies of each other. Unlike, for instance, Team Fortress 2, where a clean silhouette is essential for communicating the nature of a character, we had an opportunity here to play with designs that were a bit messy, with things sticking out of them so they looked half manufactured, half improvised. Once we had agreed on rough designs in 2D, we began to build the shapes in 3D, 
and this is where the next level of improvisation and experimentation occurred. Usually, a model will be designed and built in 3D and then rigged for animation, but here we allowed the rigging process to inform the models. We wanted to celebrate the mechanics of robots. We allowed function to dictate form, and in terms of detail, they started to design themselves once you start thinking about motors, ball joints, actuators, and all that sort of thing. The classic duo is often made up of two contrasting body types, short and squat next to tall and wiry. And it's not hard to see Laurel and Hardy, C-3PO and R2-D2 in these characters. Even though we had the freedom to make our silhouettes a bit untidy, it was still important that they remain readable as anthropomorphic bipeds. We wanted players to feel free to make mischief for their partners in a typically human way, but without creating any kind of gore. The robots were perfect for this. The orange bot has been described as finicky, and you can see elements that are somewhat bird-like and even reminiscent of the odd couple's Felix Unger. The gotta pee idol dance was born out of the idea that current bipedal robots are constantly needing to readjust in order to find their balance. Because orange's design is rather unstable, the motion design solution was kind of a perpetual motion needed to maintain his balance. If the orange bot is the odd couple's Felix, then blue is Oscar. Blue was meant to be an early and rather rough prototype robot, representing Gladys's first attempt at making a bipedal testing bot. Compared to the sleek lines of orange, he's much less elegant. For motion inspiration, we looked to some of our favorite real-life robots, such as the big dog robot from MIT and the towel-folding robot from Hitachi. In our original robot designs and the first animation tests, we started with the premise that, being robots, their movement should have limited personality and be a bit more mechanical. The feedback of our game testers and the reaction of our fans to the trailers convinced us that a more whimsical approach to the animation would lead to a better experience. So we moved away from a sterile approach and found a whole new range of possibilities as we began to explore their personalities and gestures. Since the co-op characters can die at any time, we needed a way to rebuild them quickly and often. Therefore, in co-op, we replaced the elevators that connected test chambers in single player with disassembly machines. These are meant to reinforce the idea that since the robots are disposable, being destroyed is no big deal. In the robot world, it happens all the time. 